he's the best sports writer in America. He's more than that. He's Wright Thompson, ESPN senior writer, saw that he did a long, well, he always does a deep dive. And uh, he did a deep dive on uh, Joe Montana. And I thought, all right, uh, you got my attention here. Wright Thompson joining us on the program. What made you decide to do a deep dive into Joe Montana? always felt like I didn't know anything about him and I didn't really understand I don't know, what, what made him who he was like I, he just seemed like one of those guys who uh, the more time elapsed from his playing career the more of a mystery he seemed to me I don't know if he seems that way to other people but I just was curious what it was like to be and have been Joe Montana what was Montana's reaction to you wanting to do a deep dive? Yeah. I mean, he, he, he came around eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Joe doesn't like talking about Joe. No, 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 he does not. Uh, uh, I just sort of figured if I never went away, eventually he was just going to have to deal with the fact that it's happening. What was that uh, first uh, meeting like, that first conversation like? Well, you know, I, I think he was curious why I wanted to know things about his psyche as opposed to about what it felt like to throw the ball to Dwight Clark. Uh, you know, you could sort of see that, like, okay, what is this? Uh, I mean, you know Joe, I'm sure, very yeah. well. I mean, he's lovely. Uh, you know, that there is this sense, at least, I don't know if you've ever gotten the sense around him, but, you know, that, that he is lovely, but there are universes below the surface. And so one of the things that, you know, I did one interview with him and had hoped on some level, like, hey, maybe that'll be enough. And then just kept going back again and again and again, because when you meet him, you do sense that, hey, this is a guy who has a really complex and serious interior life. And I would like to know about that. I mean, Ronnie Lott, one of the first things he said was like, the key to understanding Joe is that Joe was an only child. And Ronnie Lott was like, so Joe lived much of his childhood in his own head and, uh, hmm. and then Ronnie looked at me and goes, and he still does. Well, and, and I've been around him in social settings as well, and you would never know that he was one of the great quarterbacks of all time. There, there's nothing about him that exudes that, even, even his size. You know, I think they thought he was a kicker when he first showed up for the uh, 49ers because he's so slight. But I also wondered about this, and, and we have Tom Brady, who is now that guy. Joe used to be that guy. Now, what does Joe think about where he is in in the uh, the you know pantheon of quarterbacks now that Brady has superseded him? Oh, I mean, he hates it. You know, I mean, like I think. Uh, does he and, say you know, he hates it? Very, he said, you know how Joe is. He's like, but yes, absolutely. I mean, he uh, he watches the he watches the games. He. He, like the rest of us, wants to know why Pete Carroll didn't give the ball to Marshawn Lynch. <laughs> okay. You know, I mean, he was just like, give the damn ball to Marshawn. I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, I spent a decent amount of time around him, and I think it's he's less jealous of the rings than he is of the fact that he gets to watch someone else sort of live his life that got ripped from him. And also, you know, these guys like dominance. I mean, there's a story in there about Walmart paid Dan Marino, Joe Montana, Johnny Unitas, and John Elway to do an event. And they went out to dinner afterwards. And, you know, they're laughing and drinking, and the check comes, and uh, Joe Montana sort of smiles and is like, whoever has the fewest rings pays. <laughs> yeah. And so they, they, they determine that, uh, that Joe had four and that uh, Elway has two. And Unitas has one Super Bowl ring, but three NFL championship rings, which at that table counts as four. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think Marina drops an F-bomb and has to reach for the check. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, these guys like the dominance. I mean, you don't get to be Joe Montana or Johnny Unitas or Sammy Baugh or Tom Brady or Patrick Mahomes without wanting to be dominant. Uh, and, you know, I, so I don't think it's much of a surprise that he doesn't like being knocked off the mountaintop. Uh, the thing I found interesting, and, you know, you know this so well, but bitterness is such a common affliction of once great athletes that it's almost no, it's almost most noteworthy when it's absent. 
you know, I mean, Joe DiMaggio famously was miserable. And so, uh, and you know, and Montana knew DiMaggio a little bit. And, like, I find it such an interesting hmm. continuum that, like, that these guys, they seem like names from the past, and yet their lives have something to offer, not just Joe Montana and Tom Brady, but Patrick Mahomes and all these guys, because everywhere these modern quarterbacks who are going to play on Sunday are going, there are people who have been. And so, you know, it, it's interesting to see, you know, Joe working to not be bitter and to live in the sort of full majesty of his life, which is really incredible. Uh, you know, his wife, Jennifer, I'm sure you've met, uh, pulls no punches when talking about her very complex man who she loves very much. But is she's like, I think he's the happiest he's ever been. And, uh, and that's really interesting. But Brady's dominance and blowing past those four Super Bowl rings, and he's the greatest of all time, and it's not even a debate. I mean, we're, we're debating, yeah. you know, Jordan and LeBron, and Jordan hadn't played in decades, and he's still holding that mythical, you know, place in our hearts. I, don't, I, I was just wondering about that, that Joe has sort of been diminished a little bit here by Tom Brady. Yeah. Like, the, he's in that shadow of Tom Brady, who wanted to be Joe Montana playing for the Niners growing up. And I mean, two things. I mean, one, uh, one of Joe's kids, I thought it was a really savvy read was just like, look, you know, I can see the heartbreak in my dad a little bit and that he now wants to talk about football where he never wanted to talk about football. And, you know, that there is a sense of, you can feel something running through your fingers, Yeah. you know, uh, and but the other thing that is so interesting is that, you know, you come that title. Oh, this is Joe Montana, the greatest who ever did it. I mean, that starts to precede you into every room, like rose petals or something, you know. And and, and there's a morning when it's gone because you know, as you know, Joe paid such a physical price. I mean, they don't. They literally don't know how many surgeries he's had post career. It's somewhere between twenty seven and thirty five. Oh my God. And, and, you know, he, he's had before had to sleep in this Velcro back brace. And I just love it. Cause it's like, Oh, Joe Montana is all of us because his wife is like, you better wear that damn brace. And so he has it on at night and he's trying to unhook it one microfiber at a time so that it doesn't make any noise and wake her up. So she gives him crap and makes him put it back on. So I could just see Joe Montana there in the dark. You know, this is his new two minute drill. Let me just very carefully try to get this thing off. So like, and so you just love, you love that idea. I'll tell you, I came away thinking, boy, if when I'm 66, this is what my life looks like. I will feel like I did a great job. Uh, one of the things that happened with the pandemic is all the Montana kids came back home and everybody was working from home and they were having big family dinners three or four nights a week. You know, they're, there are two grandkids now, one on the way. Uh, Joe takes the oldest granddaughter to her swim lessons. I guess there's some like fancy club near their house in San Francisco. And I just love the image of all these San Francisco moms with the little kids. And then Joe Montana <laughs> getting in the pool splashing. And, uh, uh, his granddaughter wanted uh, to ride on a cable car. And Joe had only ever done that once. And I love it because he was very sheepish when I was like, when did you do that, Joe? And he was like, well, it was a commercial and it was me and Tony Bennett. And he was singing, I left my heart in San Francisco. And I'm like, you know, that's not normal life, right? <laughs> and so uh, so they took the little girl out to the streetcar and uh, it wasn't a streetcar stopped. And so the thing wasn't going to stop. And then the conductor or whatever the noun is of someone who drives a streetcar sees who it is and slams on the brakes. And so I just love the idea that, like, the great power and joy of being Joe Montana now is that he can make a streetcar stop for his granddaughter. And, like, that must just seem like such a magic trick to her. He's right. Thompson, ESPN senior writer, did a deep dive on Joe Montana. It's almost he lost his identity a little bit, where it, it was firmly cemented. He didn't have to have a sign or arrows pointing towards him because everybody knew that's Joe Montana. But then all of a sudden... Who, who is Joe Montana to these other people now? Because Tom Brady did all of these things. Patrick Mahomes is going to blow by you. Is like it just? I, I get it. And he can't go out and be competitive and play a game and say, "See, I can still do it, and I'm better than Brady was." 
you know, I, I understand that. I, I understand where you, you're kind of lost a little bit there. Well, and I also think that this is a complex uh, thing that he's lost because he, you know, in some ways, you know, he's almost like a case study in a psychological journal and that here was someone who was the very best in the world at something and then had the ability to do the thing they did better than anyone taken away, had to deal with the just huge hole in their lives. Go listen to his Hall of Fame speech. It's unbelievable how honest and naked it is. And people just missed it. He talks about how he felt like the ceremony, he could hear dirt hitting his casket. Like he was being buried alive. And that like he was not into the Hall of Fame weekend. Like he, he felt like it was a funeral. Wow. And that, like, who am I supposed to be now? So I think the greatest of all time was an easy way to talk about a complex series of losses. And so, I mean, you know, I think if you really sort of get under the hood of it, yes, he's dealing with the loss of that very simple title, but also just with everything that means. I mean, what do you do when you used to be Joe Montana and you can't do that anymore? I mean, one of the things Jennifer says is that she worries that he thinks the best part of his life is over. Oh, and yeah. that they've worked on that for a long time. Uh, you know, when you dive into somebody, you do a profile, uh, you know, you unearth all these great things. And I didn't know if, if Joe unearthed something through all of this that helps him, you know, did, you know, have some kind of epiphany or realization through all of it. I don't, that's a good question. I haven't heard from Joe. Uh, uh, I've heard from uh, some three or four, I've heard from his kids who uh, said they learned things and found it more emotional than they thought it would be. I mean, I imagine when you're Joe Montana, it's not really that big a deal to have a story written about you. Do you know what I mean? Like, like I don't know if he will approach it as, I mean, he's still in his head. He's Joe Montana. Yeah, but you're you not dissecting I mean? like, a game, right? You're dissecting him. So an outsider is looking at you under a microscope, whereas we used to just look at you and we would write about the game you played. This is life that you're analyzing. You know, that's a very good question. I wouldn't let me write about me for sure. Uh, like, like man, man, I, I got real problems that, like, I, that don't need to be on a page. Uh, uh, you know, I'm always very, very grateful. Uh, if I gave you, know, you Brady or LeBron, your next one. LeBron. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the things this story is accidentally is a profile of the next 30 years of Tom Brady's life. And I'm not entirely sure he knows what's waiting. I mean, Steve Young, who you obviously know, uh, who might be the most thoughtful retired athlete I've ever met in my whole life. I mean, just, you know, him talking about Montana and getting emotional because he had front row seats. And now that he's older, he understands he wasn't trying to, like, take Joe's job. He was trying to kill him. You know, for guys who take this as seriously as they do, mm -hmm. I think they both understood. They both understand now stakes that they couldn't possibly have understood while they were competing. And, you know, Steve talked really eloquently to me about, like, every great quarterback wants to write more in the book. And you just can't. And you can't let it destroy your whole life trying to write more in the book. And, uh, you know, talking about Joe, he said, you know, I think Joe is surprised that it turned out that what he wrote in the book wasn't enough. And that it's frustrating because he no longer has the ability to go add to it. And that if he could, he wouldn't abide this. And yet there is no mechanism for coming back. Yeah. And, you know, that's it. They, you know, I, they, Brady, yeah. They take away your pen. I mean, you know, they take away the football, but your body really takes you away from that opportunity to write any more chapters there. And in some ways, Joe is lucky in a way that, you know, the NFL that Brady played in is obviously so different. One of the things I did is go back and watch old games. And I don't know if you've done that recently, but I was staggered by the violence. Yes. Like I'd forgotten. Yes. You think the modern NFL is violent because it is. But it is, I mean, this was unbelievable. I mean, they were, you know, the number of times he got hit helmet to helmet late, driven headfirst into the ground with Leonard Marshall and LT both on top of him was just unbelievable. And so his body made a decision for him that Tom Brady's body did not. 
And so in some ways, Montana got out and started building this new life that in the last 10 years has come to fruition. And, you know, Brady had to decide himself. I mean, you know, you know Joe Montana. Joe Montana's a lunatic. He wouldn't have walked away. He's a totally insane person. He would have kept trying to win until they had to literally drag him off of the field, which is what they did. And so in some ways, that's a weird blessing. Now he's Wright Thompson, ESPN senior writer, and it's a, uh, well, as you've come to expect from Wright, it's uh, well done, and you learn more about the person than you do the athlete, because I think that's really the story. And what you said about Tom Brady doesn't realize it, but Tom Brady should really look at this, because he might be looking at this in 30 years from now, going, wait a minute, I'm not the greatest of all time, or what happened, or uh, where's my place in history? It's great to talk to you as always. I'm glad you're doing well, and uh, appreciate you joining us as always. Thanks, Dan. It was really great. Thank you so much. And that's Wright Thompson. Always wonderful. Great reaction every time we have Wright Thompson on.